Dr. Lorenzo Albertazzi, Group Leader of, of the Nanoscopy for Nanomedicine Group of IBEC. Lorenzo obtained a Master in Chemistry in 2007 and a PhD in Biophysics in 2011 from Escuela Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy. He then joined the Eindhoven University of Technology as a postdoc. In 2017, he obtained a junior group leader position in IBEC to start the Nanoscopy for Nanomedicine group. In 2017, he obtained an ERC starting grant. And since 2018, he's also associate professor at, at the Eindhoven University Department of Biomedical Engineering. Following an evaluation of IBEC's International Scientific Committee, he was promoted to senior group leader in 2019. For most of his career, he has been jumping between chemistry and biophysics. His group is now trying to combine them to achieve a molecular understanding of synthetic materials in the biological environment using optical microscopy and nanoscopy for application, among others, in the design of targeted super efficient cancer treatments. I thank you, Lorenzo, for being with us today, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Teresa, for the nice introduction and for arranging this webinar. I have to say it's my first uh, webinar, so it's a new experience for me. It's a strange to give a talk and not be able to see the audience in the face, but at the same time, it's a very nice to, to reach so many people, even during this uh, strange time of pandemic. So in this talk, I will give an overview of the activity of our group. And as you see from my title, we try to combine two things. On one side is nanomedicine, so the medical use of nanotechnology, and the word super resolved called for microscopy. So these are our technical expertise doing fluorescent microscopy and super resolution microscopy. And I try to convince you during my talk that combining these two fields is a very good idea. And before going to the science, I'll give a short introduction about uh, us, as we do not only combine fields of uh, science, but uh, we also combine countries as currently our group is delocalized between Barcelona at IBEC, of course, and at the Eindhoven University of Technology where I'm appointed associate professor. So two very different cities, only one very good for tourism. Eindhoven is maybe less interesting for that point of view, but uh, two great places to do science. And we're trying now to benefit from both the lively scientific activities in the Barcelona area with all the technical expertise that come from the Technical University in, in Eindhoven. And it's also interesting, I think, opportunity for our students of uh, some cultural exchange. So you see some photos from our retreat. Here you see one retreat where uh, both the Dutch and Spanish people can enjoy some Spanish tapas in Barcelona. And one uh, where other way around, we can, uh, we, the Spanish people can uh, discover some Dutch delicatessen like the frikandel sausage. So maybe a little bit less successful, but equally funny. And uh, you see an overview of my group. We have a nice combination of expertise. Here's some chemists, physicists, biologists, biotechnologists. We have uh, touched many fields and that's very important. We will really try to do interdisciplinary science and to combine different expertise in the multidisciplinary field of nanomedicine. Now, if you type nanomedicine on Google, this is mostly what you find. These fancy cartoons, very futuristic, the, tells us, I think, two things. The first is a beautiful dream. The idea of making a nanoscale device that can be injected in the body and it swims around and find something wrong, disease site, and then act doing something, for example, releasing the drug. That's been a dream in nanotechnology since the 50s, since the time of Feynman. Second thing is this cartoon seems to give the idea is that it's not very real. It's more like science fiction than reality. And that's not fully true. There are already nanomedicine approved for clinical use. What you see here in this picture is Doxil, is the first nanodrug clinically approved in 1997. And this is a liposomal nanoformulation that contain doxorubicin as an active drug and is now currently used in the clinic for treating several types of cancer. Now, after the introduction of Doxil, kind of 20 years ago, the field exploded. Now there's thousands or tens of thousands of paper about nanomedicine. However, the clinical successes in Doxil, so the clinical translation of nanoparticles to the clinic 
still very limited. There are only three uh, types of carriers to be clinically approved, and none of them is a targeted carrier, so it's able to have direct recognition of the cancer disease. And these years have been very crucial for the field. There have been many reviews appearing, discussing what's going wrong with nanomedicine, why there's a lack of clinical translation, many companies that invest in the clinical translation nanoparticle were bankrupt. So the whole community is asking if nanomedicine has a delivery problem. And I think it's not a problem, it's see it more as an opportunity to really sit and think on what's going wrong in this field and uh, how we can design the next generation of nanoparticle that will have a broad use in the clinic. And what I think is one of the limiting factor is that we do not know enough about nanomedicine. We don't know what happens to the nanoparticle in the biological environment. We can design a variety of materials for changing size, shape, and functionality. But then when we put these synthetic objects in contact with the, with the cells and with biology, it's a little bit like a black box, like the one in this slide. Is we don't know what's going on. We don't know how these materials behave. And it's poor, it's extremely difficult to rationally design these materials. So I think our, one of our purpose, our group is really try to open this black box and understand materials in action in the body. And we do this using microscopy. And that's the intersection between these two fields. We use optical microscopy to understand how nanoparticle behaves in the biological environment. I can think about three types of measurement that we typically run in our group. The first is that we look at our nano objects in vitro. So before the injection into the cell or, or in vivo. So we use superficial microscopy and another microscopy technique to understand the structure and properties of the carrier before entering the cell. On the total opposite side, we collaborate with biologists to look at, at our targets. We look at cancer cells and, and the biomarkers expressed on the surface of cancer cells to guide the design of more effective and selective materials. And of course, we look at the interaction. We do a lot of two colors measurements where you have on one color is the cell, like this cancer cells in green, in another color in red, for example, nanoparticle, and we can see how the two system interacts. And that tells us a lot about the design and the structure activity relationship of the nanoparticles. And I will give you during my talk uh, a couple of examples from this. But first, I want to give you a little bit of an overview or the type of microscopy and type of methods we use and what we can learn from them. So the first technique we use a lot is indeed a family of superposition microscopy called single molecule localization microscopy. And I'll give you here an example with some beautiful images from Maria Peach in my group. What you see here in the left is an image of a cell. You see the cell membrane on the bottom and you see some protrusions getting out of the cell membrane. And these are viruses budding out of the cell. This is not a, uh, no corona here, it's a bit more traditional influenza, but we are interested to see how the uh, influenza bud out of the, of the host cell to design therapies to be able to block the spreading of the virus. However, you can see that the, the image is, is rather blurred and this, the virus is very difficult to resolve. And that's because it's too small for the classical microscopy to be resolved. The trick we use is not look at the whole sample at the whole, but be able to look at one by one at all the fluorescent molecules in the system. So what you see in this video, you see blinking lights turning on and off. And, what, and these are the individual dyes that label the object. And we look at them one by one with this very sensitive microscope. And for every dye, we localize where it is. We put a small dot in the center and we move to the next. And then we can reconstruct an image based on this localization of individual dyes. And as the localization are very accurate, the final image will be extremely improved. And this is what we can image thanks to the technical storm. We now achieve a resolution of 20 nanometer, about 10 times better than classical resolution. And now it's perfectly clear how is the structure of the virus? You see these filaments budding out. You see where they're broken, where, where they originate from the cells. So this is a technique to, we use to access nanoscale resolution and look at cells and nanoparticles and how they interact. 
So far, the technique has been mostly developed for biology, and what has been the main contribution to this field is to bring this technique to the fields of material and nanotechnology. So this here is the first example of storm techniques applied to synthetic materials. These are some nanofibers we synthesized in the lab in Eindhoven. And again, when you image with classical microscopy, you can see there's a fiber-like profile, but the, the image is very blurred, the fibers got on top of each other, it's very difficult to see this like structure. And again, the storm will be able to achieve nanoscale resolution and look at the detail of this material with unprecedented detail. So this is the first example, the opening door or the uh, nanoscopy to the fields of nanomedicine. And we spent quite some time in the following years to expand these methods. And we can now image almost every material used in the fields of nanomedicine, self-assembled fibers, block of polymers, polymer assemblies, crystals, inorganic particles like silica, lipid nanoparticle. And for all of them, we achieve this 10, 20, 30 nanometer resolution that allow us to look at this material with let's say, new eyes. This is mostly done in vitro, but you can also look at the materials inside the cell with the same technique. So what you see here is a two-color tone measurement, where in green is labeled a cancer cell and ill cells, and in particular, it's stained the membrane of the cell. While in red, we stain some uh, polystyrene nanoparticle, they're around 200 nanometer in size, so beyond the diffraction limit, so uh, impossible to solve the classical microscope. Indeed, you see that there are some red spots inside, so the particles have internalized inside the cell, but it's very difficult to resolve exactly where single particles are and where they localize in the cell. And again, you know, the trick, press a button and a super resolution image appear, and we can now have much better view on the localization of particles. We can really zoom in, see individual nanoparticles, you see they're inside the cell. These are the red part, right part is inside the cell, the left is outside. You can measure their size, and we correctly assign the size of 200 nanometers inside the cell. And we can start to look at the interaction between the cells and nanoparticles. Here you see a nanoparticle being internalized by a cell. You see the cells protruding the membrane and grabbing the nanoparticle to be internalized. So to some extent, it's not the particle that enters the cell, it's the cells that eat the nanoparticle because they find it uh, tasty and interesting enough. So it already gives some information on how to design your particle to be internalized more effectively. The, um, these techniques provide a lot of information about where, so about the position of nanoparticles. But there's so much more that we can learn about our nanoparticles. So generally, to have more functional information, use spectroscopy by distinguished by the color, some states or functional information about the nanoparticle. And what we are trying to do is to combine spectroscopy in microscopy in what is called spectral imaging. So this is one technique we are using also a lot in the lab. And I will show you some examples. What you see here is an image of a nanoparticle labeled in green that have been given to some cancer cells. And this is a classical confocal image where you can see the localization of the particle. You see the particle is a lot outside the cell and it's also been internalized in this dotted structure, the uh, endosomes. However, we don't know the state of the particle. For example, one important question is, is the particle still assembled or it fell apart in its component releasing the drug that is inside? And from this image, you can only know where it is, but not how it is. What we apply here is spectral imaging combined with the smart labeling where the, the dye that we label the particle with tell us, depending on the color, if the particle is assembled or disassembled. In particular, switch from uh, green emission if the particle is still assembled to blue if it fell apart and release the drug that is inside. And what you can get is this type of images. Basically, from every pixel, we can measure an emission spectra and tell if the particle is together or it fell apart. And you see, Outside the cells, you see a lot of green, means the particle is still acting together as a particle, while inside the cell, you see purple that uh, correspond to the spectra of the disassembled components. So this allows us to screen a good particle that stay intact until it reach its target and only at the right moment fall apart and release the cargo. Now, this is done in a 
more in confocal classical uh, microscopy, so we don't have super resolution here. But what we're trying to do is to bring this to the field of super resolution. And this is the work uh, of Manos, a PhD student in a group in collaboration with Peter Zastra. Whereas he, Manos built a setup to be do, able to do super resolution and spectral detection at the same time. And this is what we measure. You see an image on the right. And on the left part of this image, you see dots that are our nanoparticles. This tells where the particles are. And then these stripes on the right part are basically emission spectra associated to every particle. So basically for every particle, we can get a spectra that tells the emission properties. And this, again, it allows us to do spectroscopy and microscopy on single particle basis and even single molecule basis. Here you see a, sim a similar movie of blinking lights that are individual molecules. And for every single molecule, we can detect an emission spectra. So we can do basically spectroscopy at the single molecule level. And this is a technique now we are trying to apply to several types of nanoparticles to understand better the properties. Last technique that we use a lot and we want to discuss today is correlative imaging. And for me, correlative imaging is a little bit like uh, Google Maps. In Google Maps, I think you can get two types of information. One is more about a physical map. So you, so you can know there is a, a lake like here in the, on the right part of this map. You can, there's a, a, a street, there are a forest. Plus you have some point of interest. So you know, for example, where your favorite bar is or where our department is. In this case, the, the map of our campus of uh, University of Eindhoven. And this, to some extent, what you want to know as well when you think about biology and nanomedicine. You have, want to have a full map of the physical aspects of the map of the cell, where the cell is and where the organs are. And at the same time, you want to know where the object of interest is. And there's very few techniques can provide both. For this reason, we apply correlative approach, means we measure two techniques at the same time that can provide two types of information about the same field of view. And this is a recent example from a group. In, there's a beautiful image from Sylvia in collaboration with group of Sander van Kasten in Leiden. What you see here is an electron microscope image of a cell, and you can, it is in gray. You can appreciate the ultra structure of the cell. See the vacuoles, the you see a mitochondria where the profile of the membrane is. And on top, we have a microscopy fluorescent image. And fluorescence is a molecularly specific technique. We label a molecule of interest we are interested in. And then we know we see only the molecule where it is on the map. And you see, this is the blue signal overlay to the 10 image. So with this, we can get a bit the best of both worlds. The ultra structure of the cells from electron microscopy and where our particle or molecule of interest is by fluorescent microscopy. And like this, we can try to get the best of both worlds and get more information about the trafficking of particles inside the cell. So overall, I think we have a rather broad toolbox of super resolution techniques to look at nanomedicine. And these are the techniques we're trying to use to answer some key questions in the field that will allow us to design better medicines. And I will focus today on a couple of stories that are uh, particularly active in our group. And the one is more on materials and one more on the biological side. So the first question we have about materials is about heterogeneity. So this is again a cartoon from the internet about nanoparticles. And it is gives a bit the idea how people look at nanoparticles. All the same, all perfectly defined, all clones. And we, we question ourselves, are really so perfect and equal among each other? Now, is known, for example, if you look at the electron microscopy image of, the, of particles, that the, they're not all the same. For example, they have different sizes. And this is in, indicated as polydispersity or heterogeneity. So you see in this image PGA particles, where every particle is slightly different size from each other. But there's way more properties that can be different between particles. So we are using now super resolution microscopy to look at single particles and see how different are from each other and how the population is constituted and how to relate these properties to function. And this is the first example I want to show. Here we're looking at a gene delivery carrier. These are polyplexes. 
And these are nanoparticles made of two components. One is a genetic material, it could be RNA or DNA. So this is the medicine you want to deliver to do gene therapy. Together with generally a polymer that because of the opposite charge can complex to the DNA or RNA forming a particle. So the, this is more the carrier part of the nanoparticle. And uh, our question is simple, like is the composition between the two components the same for every particle or there's heterogeneity between particles and the components because that will, will be very important for the delivery properties. And to do that, we label the RNA and the polymer in red and green respectively and do two color super resolution to look at the composition of the particles. And this is a low resolution image of a nanoparticle. They look yellow because nanoparticle contain both components. And if you zoom in with our super magnifying lens, we can now see single particles and see the two components that are inside. And what we did is for many types of formulation, here you see four formulation changing the ratio between the two components, we can measure several parameters per particle. We can measure the size of every single particle and the amount of the RNA and on the cationic polymer. So this for every particle, we can get all this information and compare particle by particle to look at the heterogeneity. There's a lot of data in this, uh, in this slide. I will not go to the details. You can ask if you're interested. I just want to show you this graph. In this graph, we are plotting the amounts of the two components of the polymer on the x-axis and on the RNA on the y-axis. And every dot you see here is a particle. And this shows how broad is the population we get. So you see particles with the bottom left, the little amount of both components, particles that are more of both. And then in colors, you see their size. That also changes particle by particle. So this really gives you idea how disperse in properties our, our batches of nanomedicine. And these are some of these type of um, materials are already used in the clinic. And you can think about some of these particles be, because of the properties will be very effective and maybe do all the therapeutic job. And some others that because of the properties are unfavored, they will do nothing or even generate toxicity. So I think it's our job as nanotechnologists to understand in this diagram, which particles are the good ones and make 100% of them. And second example I want to discuss with you today is about functionality. Like it's a common approach in uh, nanomedicine to functionalize nanoparticles with proteins uh, as targeting ligands, for example, antibodies. And these antibodies that will have to recognize a biomarker on the surface of the cancer cells and trigger the selective accumulation of the nanoparticle in the tumor. And then we start with a very simple question. If you functionalize the particle with proteins, how many there are? and how many are distributed and how many are active. And surprisingly, there's no way in the literature to quantify very effectively this. And these are the methods we come up with to answer these questions. We design a probe that is made of the targeting uh, epitope for the protein, the ball you see there, attached with the DNA sequences. So what will happen is every functional protein and only the functional ones will be able to bind and fish from the solution one of these probes. Then we can add a complementary DNA sequence with a, a dye that will bind reversibly to the DNA anchored on the, on the particle. And this technique is called DNA paint. Basically, every time a dye binds to the complementary DNA, we will see a single molecule, we localize, and we use the same super resolution trick I mentioned before. And we counting the events, also called Q-paint, will allow us to tell how many functional ligands are on the surface of particles. And this is a typical image we get. You see in green the center of the particles, in red every single dot is one binding event, so correspond to one targeting ligand present on the surface of the particle. As you see in the negative control, where there's a wrong hybridization sequence, the signal is almost absent, indicating what we see is actually specific and exactly what we want to see. And an interesting feature is that we can do this for many uh, targeting ligands on the surface, and so we can do multicolor imaging with a trick. If we do multicolor not by different physical colors, different wavelengths, 
by using different DNA sequences. So basically we tag every molecule of interest with a specific DNA sequence and then we can address separately using one microfluidic device. So basically we first look at the DNA sequence number one and get an image, then DNA sequence number two, three, four, and we can go ahead as many as we want because there's a, an infinite number of DNA sequences you can code. And these have been used here, for example, to map the presence of antibodies on the surface of a particle to different antibodies. It can be spatially resolved and counted. And then also here you see that every particle has a different distribution, a different number of targeting ligands. And this indeed is one of the output of this, uh, this, this work, that there's a significant heterogeneity between particles also in the presence of targeting ligands. So you see by eye in the image that the particles are more or less the same size. There's indeed a five, 10 percent dispersed in size. However, you see much more signal coming from some particles while other particles seem to have much less events. So it means that they have much less uh, targeting ligands on their surface. And indeed, if you look at the population, you see the graph on the bottom right, you see there's a very big heterogeneity in the amount of, of targeting ligands. So we have particles with only 100 or 200 ligands and particles with five or 10 times more. And also in this case, you can imagine that the particle with 100 or with 1,000 ligands will behave completely different in interaction with the cells. So there's not so much heterogeneity in size in this case, but the big dispersity in functionality. And this is also true between particles and but also within particles. So here you see two examples. On the top there's a particle where the ligands are distributed rather homogeneously on the surface, while on the bottom one, because of some imperfection in the synthesis, you have some patches, some cluster of antibodies. And that's of course will also change the ability to target it because there are areas with high density and low density in the same particle. So there's two types of heterogeneity, inter-particle, but also intra-particle, and they, they are coexistence of homogeneous and patchy particles. So as a take-home message for this part, I think we should really look at the, the materials we produce more as a population, where every particle is a bit different from each other, and we should understand if this heterogeneity is good or bad is uh, not obvious that it's a negative thing because also the cells you target are heterogeneous. The biology has a lot of heterogeneous phenomena, so maybe we want our particle to be a bit different from each other to target a broader population of cells, but for sure we want to understand it and control it. And that I think is one of the next challenges in this field. And in the last part of my talk, I will discuss more of a, a biological type of measurement we do. And this is in the field of targeting. So there's a idea in the field that the, to achieve selective delivery of the nanoparticle with the drugs to cancer cells, you should uh, functionalize them with some ligands that recognize a marker on the surface of cancer cells. But often there's a, a bit of a too simplistic idea. Because one of the ideas is that this biomarker that you see here only on the black cells is 100% and highly expressed on the cancer and is never express in the healthy cells, but that's hardly happens. So what happens in reality is you have the, the receptors in both the healthy and the cancer cells, but a bit more expressed on the cancer cells. So that makes the job of the particle way more difficult. Moreover, every cell is slightly different from each other because there's uh, a biological variability. So we have now cells, cancer cells and healthy cells, they have a variable amount of targeting ligands. And that makes the design of a very selective particle extremely difficult because there's so many uh, phenomena to take in account and so many parameters to tune. The density of the ligands, their affinity, the kinetic affinity. So that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to design targeted medicine. And there's no targeted nanomedicine in the clinic now for this reason, I think. So we were trying to tackle this uh, issue using microscopy and uh, microscopy give a more better view on the targeting phenomenon and on the parameters involved. And hopefully, thanks to this, we can design better medicine. In particular, today I want to talk about how to look at biomarkers on the surface of cancer cells. So we are very active in designing microscopy methods as a diagnostic tool to more sensitively and accurately 
measure biomarkers on surface of cells and therefore design better particles. So this is a method we recently developed, is a work mostly from uh, Pietro, a postdoc in the group, and in collaboration with David and Donald in the University of Missouri in the US. And with them, we designed some uh, probes based on aptamers. So aptamers are DNA-based molecules able to recognize a target. And these are functionalized with fluorescent dyes. These aptamers are designed to bind to a selective biomarker of interest, but also to controlly unbind from it. So what will happen is the aptam will bind, it will follow the receptor for a certain amount of time, and the receptor moves because it can surf and diffuse on the membrane, and then will unbind. And the information we can get out is the level of receptor expression, because the number of these binding and binding event will correlate with the receptor expression. And we also get information about the diffusion property, so the mobility of the biomarker on the surface. That's another important parameter for the targeting. So for this, and this is the work done mostly by the collaborator, we design the specific probes for this technique. We start from Aptama, the known and commercial available, like the uh, was Aptama here. And through mutagenesis, they generate a library of Aptamas, and these aptamers have tune affinities. And uh, we have uh, aptamers with a uh, higher affinity that we use for uh, follow the receptors for longer time, so obtain longer trajectories, or with lower affinity. And that will give more events because they will bind and unbind more frequently and allow us to uh, measure the expression level of the receptor more accurately. And this is the type of, of data we generate. What you see here is a cell. Every single dot you see is one aptam that is bound to a biomarker of, of interest. In this case, is the EGFR receptor, uh, very standard cancer markers for some variety of cancers. And you can acquire movies where you will see aptam binding, so a new fluorescent spot appearing, moving because of the diffusion of the receptor and its mobility, and then disappearing because the aptam unbinds. And a new one can bind to sample another receptor. And we can run this movie and then run a beta analysis that will allow us to get the number of events and the trajectories, and the trajectories contain information about the mobility of the receptor. And this is what we learn from the diffusion behavior of the receptor. We first see many type of diffusion uh, of the receptor, different type of diffusion. We see both Brownian, like the black trajectory, but also confined diffusion, so some of the receptor seems to be blocked on the membrane, while others move extremely fast, like the red one, you see the mean square displacement going super linearly, because there's probably some biological machinery that transport this receptor from one side to the other of the cell. So there is a, a variety of behavior of the receptor. So through a combination of Brownian and non-Brownian motion. In the second, we can identify two population based on their diffusion coefficient. Seems to have one population, EGFR is rather mobile and is the biggest population, but a smaller population that you see on the left that is rather blocked and not moving in the membrane. And this could have a different biological behavior and a different interaction with the nanoparticle. So there was important information for targeting. Second, as mentioned, you can get to the expression level. Here we compare three cell lines a431 uh, are uh, lung cancer, while MDA and MCF7 are both example of breast cancer. And we look at the expression of the EGFR as biomarker in the uh, three cell types. And we clearly show that the, in the lung cancer, the expression is extremely high compared to the two breast cancer cells. And the MDA, the intermediate expression, while MCF7 are completely negative for this biomarker. And this, of course, very important to design a targeted particle. We use less to target. EGFR, if you have an MC7 type of cell, well, it seems a very good idea for the A431. And finally, I want to show how this information can be combined. As we get both information at the same time, the diffusion and the number of events and expression. So for example, we can separate the uh, receptors for their mobility properties, the slow and the fast one, and see where the events localize. So you can get, you see in the bottom part, a map where the slow receptors are and a map where the fast receptors are. Or we can see 
uh, a map where the special population of uh, receptor R, for example, the one that travel long distance. So we can get a multimodal type of imaging where a lot of information about the receptors are obtained and hopefully will allow us to better classify cell types and use this as a diagnostic tool. So I think my time is uh, running out. Uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, using microscopy to understand better the behavior of nanomedicine material is a good idea and it will provide a lot of information how to better design material. So what we try to push is a microscopy guided by Matisse design. And finally, my most important slide, we have to thank, of course, the institution that uh, give us the money to perform this research, in particular the Spanish and the Dutch government, the European Union through the ITN project and the, to the ERC project. But most important, I want to thank people in my group for the fantastic job they're doing. For me, it's easy to sit here and press buttons and every time a beautiful image appears, but uh, all these techniques are not easy to run and they're mastering them and putting great efforts to make this technique to work and get the useful information out of them. And I think they're doing a fantastic job in that. And uh, with this, I think I concluded and I'm uh, happy to take uh, Skype questions. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Now uh, it's time for questions. Please write them on the chat. And we are going to try that the person asks their own question. So I would ask Aina Bal to unmute her mic and ask her question. Please, Aina. Aina Bal. Hola, can you hear me? Sorry. Can you hear me? I, I can, no. but uh, I hear only you. Okay. Uh, Aina Abad is in the room? Yes, yeah, she hears you, but she doesn't have mic. Okay. Aina, hey. please, please switch on your mic and make your question. Teresa, she wrote that she doesn't have a mic. She's uh, writing on the chat. You can see. Okay. Okay. So I, I will. I will. I will read the. Maybe question. you can read it. So um, she wanted to ask if you could go a bit more into detail in how the binding and binding events correlate with expression of receptors. Yeah, that's a good question, but it was a bit fast. So. Uh, sorry, let me go to the slide. Yeah. So, um, the number of events of binding and unbinding depends on few factors. First, the concentration of the probe. Higher the concentration of the probe, more events we will have. It, they will, they depends on the affinity of the probe for the receptor. So higher the K-on of the probe, more times we will bind. And lastly, on the number of receptors on the membrane. More receptor, more the chance to bind because it's a second order kinetic. So it depends on the concentration of the probe, but also on the concentration of the receptor. And the K-on and the concentration of the probe, we fix it and we keep it constant among the different samples. So the only thing that changes between the different cell lines is the concentration of the receptor. And that's what we probe. That's why we correlate the uh, signal we measure with the concentration of the receptor on the, on the membrane. But that's of course crucial to keep concentration of probe, imaging parameters, and, um, and the affinity of the probe constant between samples. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Before I have an Okay, thank you. And now we go to Enrico Almici. Enrico, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Yes. Hello, thank you very much uh, for uh, the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering if you 
whether you com could comment uh, on the um, limitations of the techniques that uh, you employ uh, in the, this uh, last uh, uh, part of your work um, to apply the, this technique to uh, um, uh, studies uh, of cells embedded in a three-dimensional uh, environment and whether yeah. you are already working uh, on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Um, most of the measurements I've showed so far are on uh, cells and cultures, so only on um, two, di two dimensional cultures, so the cells are directly on the glass. Um, there is a most important limitation is that uh, you want to achieve a very high signal to noise to localize a single molecule. As for the reason, we excite in either tier for inclined illumination. So basically, we illuminate only the bottom part of the sample. Because like this, you can achieve better signal to noise. We don't have out of focus uh, fluorescence or scattering. Because the reason with the uh, permeation, so how much we can get into a sample, is rather limited to a few microns. So that's not really suitable for very large samples like uh, thick slices or an hydrogel or an organoid. Um, so we cannot go beyond a few microns with these techniques. What we can do though is to, if you work in uh, fixed uh, slices, you can cut slices at different heights and you can cut slices, for example, one or two microns. And then you can uh, image them uh, with our technique with the same or comparable resolution and uh, and properties. So in the sense, you cannot really look at a thick sample, but you can slice it and look at it. And uh, it's something we're trying indeed, because of, it will be very useful, for example, for uh, histological sections, for ex vivo um, measurements, but also to to image uh, hydrogels, uh, organoids, organ on a chip, these type of models that are more complex than 3D. Thank you. Does that answer the question? So, uh, thank you. He says thank you. Uh, okay. okay. Um, anyone else? More questions? Please write on the chat. In the meantime, uh, I was wondering about the part that you explained about the different distribution of nanoparticles in size, etc. And I wonder whether is it technically possible to build more uh, uniform nanoparticles i mean can we see that they are different but can we build them equal or um yes and no there are some example of materials that uh, can be designed let's say with absolute precision for example uh, dna origami is one example is a material that's only made of dna that uh, hybridize and form uh, 3d structures and there we can design whatever we want in theory of shapes and, uh, and functionalities um, for other type of nanoparticles is more complicated but i think uh, one of this is blocking the the literature is not only the ability to make it more mono dispersed but assume that you can uh, build every particle you want you can choose every property which one is the right one so you need first to understand what you want before investing a lot of efforts in make it perfect because you don't want to spend 10 years to optimize a method to make a nanoparticle perfectly homogeneous, but then you make the wrong one. And this is also correlated to the fact that we are not sure if it's better to make them monodispersed. So this is the first time we start to see this heterogeneity and we are investigating what's the consequence, if it's good or, or making the particle worse in their behavior. So there's still a lot of um, let's say fundamental research to do on this to understand it. I think it would be possible if you if you tell someone you have to make a particle with these properties. Chemist will make it. it will will spend a lot, It will not be easy. It will, it will be a lot of implementation. But if there's a clear goal, I think is possible to improve. The the question is what is the clear goal? You want? Okay, uh, more questions. Well, um, yes, we have a question from uh, Ahmed Katib Book Kalfa. Uh, Ahmed, could you please make your question? Um, uh, so, very good talk. Thank you for the seminar. I was just um, wondering if, like, is there any differences when we are talking about uh, cancer cells? Is there any different approaches for 
a cancer type in particular or all the cancer cells are uh, like have um, the same approach you you studied in this seminar thank you yeah thanks for the question um let me take it a bit more general um the methods we develop can be applied to any cells for example this uh, aptam uh, method we do, we use it for lung and breast but there's no big difference into apply the methods for another cell type we have some uh, uh, type of cancer we more more focus on in our group because we want to at some point to focus and get biological expertise. So we mostly focus on breast and, and prostate cancer, but in principle the methods are generally applicable. For the therapy, that's a completely different story. I think the the idea that you have one medicine drug or nanomedicine, whatever it is, that will cure all the type of cancer, I think is unreasonable. So the one fit it all would never work. And it would be a matter to understand for the different type of cancer that they have different features, what is the right approach. And I think in some cases, nanomedicine will really help. And in some other cases, it would be better to give traditional chemotherapy or immunotherapy or something else. So I think there's a big uh, field now is personalized medicine, try to find the right therapy for the right patient. And that's, I think, that where we should go look in the future in terms of therapy. But for the methods, I think our methods are rather general. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, now, okay, we have uh, Monica Panarraga. Please, Monica. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. And I was wondering, how do you get your cells in focus when you do this beautiful scanning on your receptors? Is it a real cell or is it a membrane that you have uh, somehow produced? Thank you. So the cells, this is a, a monolayer of cells, so they're just growing directly on glass. And um, as we're interested in the receptors on the, on the membrane, we generally look at in TIRF, so total internal reflection illumination. It means that we illuminate only the very, very bottom of the cells, only the first 100 to 100 nanometer. So we basically look only at the basal membrane with this uh, illumination. And that fits very well the, the membrane receptor because we look only, basically almost only at the membrane, ignoring the rest of the cell. And, um, and this makes us higher signal to noise and it's easy to focus because you focus on the basal membrane of the cell. If the cell is uh, in a 3D environment or uh, you're interested in the apical membrane, that's a little more complex to, to find the right focus. Thank you. One more question or comment? Well, in the meantime, I take the opportunity to ask you because, Lorenzo, you're a very young scientist. You have been very successful in the last year and you have been able to combine different fields while at the same time starting a family. So I, I wonder if you can, I don't know, um, because there are many young people also in the audience and I think that it is important to start stressing that I mean, scientists have a personal life and uh, they have their ins and outs. I don't know. So maybe if you can comment on or give some advice to the audience or I don't know how is about your personal experience. And oh, well, that's a very difficult question. Uh, but first, I'm happy I'm still considered young scientist from so uh, getting old. Um, well, work work life balance is uh, is difficult. Uh, science is a very dynamic environment. You probably you all know, and you all experiencing it from the PhD post uh, group leader doesn't get easier. Uh, so it's very demanding. And at the same time, of course, uh, I'm happy to have my personal life, a family, have a daughter. So it's uh, it's difficult. I don't think there's a specific recipe that fits fits everyone. Everybody finds a different balance. I think. Uh, you should think about yourself, what are your priorities? And uh, I see the thing is important to, to strike a balance though, to think about it uh, and think about it in the sense that uh, if you don't 
plan it and don't organize it, then you will see that your work will start to eat it, eat more of your life and that will be very difficult. So you should find your balance and, and put some limits in that and then organize it accordingly. And this balance is different for everyone. Talk to talk to all your colleagues and talk to the people that be the height of your career and see get a, gather many experiences. I ask questions how they do this or that and uh, and see how the people do and uh, and that will be inspiring for you but then you have to find your own your own way and that's different for everyone i think is uh you read a, you read a lot of recipes but i don't think it's one single recipe for all it's like the nanoparticles right? it's just to personalize it and uh choose choose a good institution and a good pi more than the project more than i think it's a lot about it's very important to have institutions that care about the people or a PI that uh, if you're PhD or postdoc, they care about the people. I think it's very important. Is uh, is the choose the people in the institution, and then also an interesting project. But uh, if you have a a PI or an institution that doesn't support you in in that, is very difficult. So I was lucky to to be supported in that. Okay, thank you. And uh, now we have one. La we Last question from Ariana Daska. Ariana, please. Ariana Daska, I don't know, maybe she doesn't have a mic. Ariana, let me see. Well, then I will read the question. Um, when nanoparticles enter the body, they can be limited, for example, by proteins if they bind to them. Would they hinder the targeting of the particles? Answer, short answer, yes. And actually, we are studying that. I didn't talk about it today, but we're using microscopy to look indeed at what is called protein corona. So the, uh, the fact that the proteins in the blood and the serum stick to the surface of the nanoparticle and block the surface and, and change their activity. And in this case, we label the protein from the blood with a fluorescent dye and we visualize how many and which type of proteins they stick on our nanoparticles. Um, maybe to make a very general comment, there's a nanomedicine is very complicated because there's a lot of things to do right. You want to have particles that are non-toxic, that are not taken by the immune cells, then the proteins arrive, you don't want the proteins to stick to the, to the nanoparticle. So you want to pass all this barrier issue they, they to get out of the blood into the tissue, they to reach the cancer cells and only there release the drug. So there's a lot of aspects that have all have to be checked. And that's make it very difficult. In our group, we try to try to look at all of them or most of them. And uh, yeah, it's uh, still challenging because you have to do all right. And protein corona and protein absorption is one of the things you have to do well. But we, we are looking at that. I can, uh, you write me, I can send you our work on that. We can, we can ask questions more, more in detail. Okay. 